In late February 1942, Japanese invasion forces seemingly could not be stopped anywhere in Southeast Asia. The stunning speed of their advances through the Dutch East Indies had the Allies on their heels, desperate for a change in fortune. The Dutch Admiral Dorman, commander of Allied naval forces in the region, led his command of five cruisers and nine destroyers to intercept the amphibious invasion convoy headed for the island of Java. In the evening of February 27th, they encountered the Japanese task force which was escorting the convoy. The forces were of relatively comparable strength, but Admiral Dorman did not know the Japanese ships had an ace up their sleeve. Seemingly out of the blue, the Dutch destroyer Kortnar exploded, snapped in half, and sank. Later in the evening, the cruisers Java and the flagship De Reuter suffered the same fate. The long lance torpedoes of the Imperial Japanese Navy had taken the first of what would become many victims. The very first effective self-propelled torpedo was developed by Robert Whitehead in 1866, and by the start of the 20th century, small torpedo boats carrying the weapons were an integral part of most major navies. In an era where the biggest ships with the biggest guns generally won, the idea that smaller, cheaper ships could sink the armored dreadnoughts was very attractive. Unfortunately, these early torpedoes were slow, unreliable, and ineffective. However, two major battles gave a glimpse of the potential power of the torpedo against capital ships. At the Battle of Tsushima in 1905, the Japanese Navy dealt a devastating blow to the Russian fleet, including the sinking of the battleship Kinya Suvorov with torpedoes. Later during World War I, the Italian Navy scored a stunning victory over the Austro-Hungarian battleship squadron in the Strait of Otranto, when the dreadnought SMS St. Isfin was sunk by motor torpedo boats. To keen observers, there were lessons to be learned from these battles. Between the World Wars, the Imperial Japanese Naval High Command faced a strategic problem with no obvious solution. With a potential conflict in the Pacific looming, they knew they would be outnumbered by the combined U.S., British, and Dutch fleets. To even the scales, a new approach and new weapons would be needed. If Japanese cruisers and destroyers could be threats to enemy capital ships, then the problem became solvable. But this would require a new torpedo, one with long range, a massive warhead, and excellent speed, and it would have to work reliably. From this expensive design process, the Type 93 torpedo was born. The resulting weapon was massive, 610 millimeters in diameter and more than 9 meters in length. It carried a 490 kilogram warhead and weighed more than 2,500 kilograms in total. Using a unique fuel system with compressed oxygen instead of compressed air, the Type 93 could travel nearly 40 kilometers and had a top speed of almost 50 knots. This was, quite simply, the most powerful torpedo in the world at the time. It wasn't without its dangers, though. No other navy in the world used compressed pure oxygen to fuel their torpedoes because it was extremely dangerous to handle and required a high level of training to avoid explosions on board. Moving forward with the Type 93 as a weapon system meant dedicating far more resources into training and tactics than any other navy was willing to do for their torpedoes. In the 1930s, the Imperial Japanese Navy drilled their torpedomen heavily and perfected operational practices which reduced the risks of having pure oxygen-fueled torpedoes on board. Entering World War II, not only were the Type 93s the best torpedoes in service with any fleet, the Japanese destroyer and cruiser crews were better trained in their usage than any of their counterparts. Additionally, Allied intelligence was unaware of the weapon's true capabilities, so the range and power of the torpedoes were a surprise to Allied captains. Very often in early combat reports, Allied commanders were sure there must have been submarines involved because they did not believe the torpedoes could have been launched from Japanese warships. This perfect storm of the best weapon being operated by the best trained crews was devastating. This was never more true than in the very first of the many naval battles which defined the Guadalcanal campaign. On the night of August 8, 1942, a Japanese force of five heavy cruisers and their escorts slipped through the slot and headed to destroy Allied invasion forces as they unloaded their soldiers and cargo onto the island of Guadalcanal. Admiral Crutchley had six heavy cruisers and their escorts to defend the transports, in theory an even match. Near Savo Island, at the mouth of the Sound, the fleets engaged each other. Within minutes of the battle starting, four Allied heavy cruisers were sinking and one of the worst naval defeats in the history of the United States Navy was confirmed. The devastating power of the Type 93 torpedoes had sunk USS Vincennes, USS Quincy, and crippled USS Chicago, 
and more than 1,000 sailors had lost their lives in what was soon to be known as Iron Bottom Sound. Even after the opening defeat of the campaign in the Battle of Savo Island, Allied commanders were still unaware of the true power of the Type 93s, and through the fall of 1942 and into 1943, the night in Iron Bottom Sound continued to belong to the Japanese torpedo men and their long lances. In total, six cruisers and 11 destroyers were sunk during the various naval battles in the Solomons after being struck by Type 93 torpedoes. In early 1943, a Type 93 torpedo ran aground on the beach near Point Cruz on Guadalcanal. Allied intelligence now finally knew the true capabilities of the weapon. Additionally, improvements in radar-controlled fire control and tactics meant that Allied cruiser and destroyer captains finally had powerful counters to the Japanese night raids. On the 1st of November 1943, the U.S. Marine 3rd Division landed on the island of Bougainville. That night, another Japanese cruiser force headed to disrupt the invasion, but this time they were met in Empress Augusta Bay by the American Cruiser Division 12, made up of four of the new Cleveland-class cruisers. This would not be another Savo Island, as the radar-controlled, rapid-firing 6-inch guns of the American cruisers poured shells into the Japanese ships, and the escorting American destroyers with their radars were able to get the upper hand on their opposing escorts. One of the many Type 93 torpedoes launched that night did hit, disabling one of the U.S. destroyers, but the Japanese force was forced to limp home badly damaged and missing several ships which had been sunk, including the cruiser Sendai. The final night naval battle of the Solomons campaign had been as decisive a victory for the Allies as the very first one had been for the Japanese. As the war continued to progress, the Imperial Japanese Navy found itself suffering from oppressive control of the skies by the fast American carrier task forces, which seemed to be everywhere. Torpedoes were useless against aircraft, and the pure oxygen powering the torpedoes became a very real threat to the ships carrying them. The heavy cruiser Suyuza was sunk at the Battle of Lady Gulf after a near miss from an aircraft dropped bomb detonated her torpedoes, and numerous other Japanese cruisers and destroyers jettisoned their torpedoes before air attacks. After 1943, only a single Allied ship was sunk by a Type 93 torpedo, the American destroyer USS Cooper at the Battle of Oamak Bay in the Philippines in December of 1944. She was the 23rd and final warship to be sunk by one of the fearsome torpedoes. In the end, the Type 93 torpedo did give the Imperial Japanese Navy a powerful advantage, but it was not enough to change the tide of the war. In the face of radar-controlled gunfire and complete air superiority, it was simply no match. But it was one of the great naval weapons of history, one that truly gave smaller ships asymmetric striking power, and was one of the first great aerial denial weapons, before either of those terms entered the lexicon of military thinking. When the great American naval historian Samuel Elliott Morrison coined the phrase long lance after the war, he captured the threat of those torpedoes perfectly, and thus the long lances of the Japanese Navy will live on in history. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like the weapons at sea video, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this one. Comments on what weapons you'd like to see covered in future videos are also always appreciated. Finally, if you want to support the channel, there's a number of unique t-shirt and hoodie designs, all designed by me, for sale in the shop.